One of the weakest requirements that we could ask of a function is for that function to be continuous. Later on, we'll think about more specific classes of functions such as differentiable functions, continuously differentiable functions, n times differentiable functions, smooth functions, and so on. Integrable functions are another class of functions that are interesting in analysis. So for a definition of a continuous function, we'll actually give two equivalent definitions. The first one should seem a little bit more familiar from a first course in analysis. So a function f that's defined on a domain in Rn is continuous at a point C which is in A if and only if for any epsilon this is the epsilon delta challenge if for any epsilon greater than zero there exists you can construct a delta to that epsilon challenge such that satisfying the following condition whenever I choose a point X in a neighborhood a delta neighborhood of the point C and I also make sure that I choose an element of A then the image of X under the function F is contained in the epsilon neighborhood around the image of C. This definition is incredibly similar to the definition of a limit for a function and when a function is continuous and C is a limit point then you can check that the limit of F as X approaches C is in fact F of C. That's if you assume the function is continuous. However, the definition of continuity does not require the point C to be a limit point. And in fact, in case it is an isolated point, you should be able to check that a function is continuous at every isolated point on its domain of definition. So, it helps to consider some examples of continuous functions. And for that, we'll list a few somewhat obvious examples and I'll state this example I'll state these examples in the form of a theorem and the theorem is the following so um, I'll list it as a list but um, the projection from Rn to R so this is the ith projection onto the ith factor in the first coordinate is continuous. The identity map from Rn to Rn is continuous. Any constant function is continuous. A constant function is one that's defined on any domain, which is again a subset of Rn for any n and its value is exactly the same no matter which point you pick. That's the definition of a constant function. And D, the very following specific function, S from R2, or rather R2N to Rn, given by S of x comma y x and y are both elements of Rn, so these are n component vectors, defined by, let me write this out, defined by x plus y. So all of these different examples of functions are examples of continuous functions. And we'll actually prove this. And the proof of the first three examples is quite easy. 
I would say that um, in every single case, um, you, and so remember what this definition requires. First it says, oh, or not, no, not only continuous, but um, I forgot to mention what the definition of continuity on the entire domain is. And a function is continuous on its entire domain if it's continuous at C for every C in its domain. So these functions are continuous on the entire domain on which they are defined. So for the proof of this, for A, B, and C, for instance, you can, if you give me an epsilon, I have to provide for you a delta, and one such delta that I think will work is epsilon itself. And you should check to make sure that this inequality, um, that this containment condition is satisfied. So for the proof of D, what we're really checking is the fact that the sum of two vectors is a continuous function in its coordinates. This is sort of intuitive, but we should actually check to make sure that this works. So for D, and it's, it's simple to just first consider the case where n equals 1, where I'm just summing two ordinary numbers. So for n equals 1, set C, so just consider some C in R2. Um, I should really say fix C to be some element in R2 and fix epsilon to be greater than zero. I have to produce for you a delta satisfying this condition, where f is the function s. And to do that, so it helps to just simplify a little notation a little bit, set b equal to the image of c. So let's actually look at the domain and codomain of this function. Here's a little uh, picture of R2, and here's a little picture of part of R. And we have this function S. And here's an element, B, in the image of this function. Let's just suppose arbitrarily that C is over here. Now, what we can do is we can also look at the set of all the points that get mapped to B as well under this function S. So let's look at the inverse image of the element B. And the inverse image is a set of all x comma y such that x plus y equals B. What exactly is this? This describes a straight line if I rewrite this as y equals minus x plus b. So this describes the straight line y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and it's negative 1 plus b. So this describes a straight line of negative 1 slope whose y-intercept is b. So let me draw that somewhere here. So it's slope negative 1. Let me try that, draw that as best as possible. This is a 45 degree angle pointing down. And it intersects the y-axis at b. So that's exactly this line. The inverse image of this element, it might help to draw this in another color. So let me draw it pink, is precisely this straight line here. And along this line is our point c, which we fixed to be arbitrary from the start. Now, what we want to do is we want to find a neighborhood around C for some delta. I haven't yet figured out what delta is. Here's going to be what delta is. Whose image under the function S gets mapped to the epsilon neighborhood around B. So we fixed epsilon, and let me draw epsilon here. So let's say epsilon is, let's say, this large. Let me extend this out a little bit further. So this is length epsilon in both directions. And what we'll do to figure out what delta should be is, We'll take the inverse image of this entire open set and see where it gets mapped to. Well, if you just think any point near B is going to get mapped to exactly another one of these lines, just shifted slightly above, because 
the y-intercept is increasing and increasing, so this line is going to be going higher and higher. So we'll get a sequence of lines like this as we move, as we increase a little bit past b, up until the point we reach b plus epsilon. So this is going to be, let's say, b plus epsilon. And we'll look at the inverse image of that point, and that's this straight line. We can go in the other direction and also look down, and we'll get this line here. So this line, let me write this out, is y equals negative x plus b plus epsilon. And this line here is y equals negative x plus b minus epsilon. So now, any, any neighborhood that's contained within this band will get mapped to this neighborhood over here around B. So our definition of neighborhood was in terms of open disks. So we can't just map over this band. Let's just pick a subset of that band. And that subset of that band will be precisely this disk that I'm trying to draw here. So we can think about what delta should be in that case. And a moment's thought about geometry, if we look at the fact that this is a 45 degree angle slope, we know that we should set delta to equal epsilon over the square root of 2. And when we do that, we're exactly looking at this neighborhood here, which is now getting a little cluttered, but this neighborhood here is precisely that disk that we're looking for. So this is our V delta around C. And just by construction of thinking about what this function is doing, we know that the image of this is going to be contained in the image of this. In other words, then, let's check to make sure, then for any x, or rather for any x comma y, for any x comma y contained in this neighborhood here, v delta around the point C, Because this neighborhood is contained within this band, and the image of this band is contained in this neighborhood, it follows that the image S, X plus Y is contained in V epsilon around B, which is the image of S, C. And this checks the condition of continuity, which proves that the addition of two numbers is a continuous function of its inputs. And you should think how this changes if we then change uh, n from n equals 1 to n equals 2, or an arbitrary n for that matter. And I'll let you to think about how to prove that theorem. So this gives us a whole slew of examples of continuous functions from higher dimensions to lower to different dimensions as well.